fourth Sunday of Lent. Can you believe it? You know, there's only six Sundays of Lent, so we're getting down to it now. Uh, Easter is April 4th, Good Friday is April 2nd, so we're, we're real close. This Lent, what we've been trying to do is to celebrate our 40-ness. You know, Lent is actually the, the church's ritual enactment, reenactment of Jesus' 40 days in the, in the wilderness, and so there's 40 days of Lent. That 40, of course, is a symbolic number. It means a time of trial and testing, initiation into a rebirth, and everywhere you see 40 in the Bible, that's what it's talking about. And Lent is for us our 40 If we can take that time where the idea is to clear out all the distractions, to clear out everything that keeps us from seeing and obscures the truth, what's really going on. For us to do that in our lives, to take the time to create some quiet space, to build our awareness throughout our day mindfully, of the connection that we have with each other, the connection we have with God's Spirit. We are preparing ourselves for the great paradox of Easter. And this is what we've been doing for the last few weeks, is understanding our fortiness, understanding the difficulty of approaching the great truths in life and the great truths of our faith because they present as paradox. They present as what we initially look at as contradiction. The trouble with contradiction is, is that it needs a solution. And so we want to solve the, and resolve the contradiction, choose one side or another as being right and the other wrong, whereas paradox also presents opposing elements. But the idea in a paradox is not to resolve it, is to push through, leaving the paradox in place, leaving the opposing elements unresolved, and see what that does as we work through. Because if we can get to the other side of paradox, what we're getting to is a deeper truth, a deeper understanding. It doesn't resolve the paradox, but it makes resolution moot in the sense that we are now seeing a unity through the Father's eyes that we didn't see before and was not presented in the original opposition. So last week we were talking about how the process actually is the goal, not the outcome as we normally assume. This process of working through is what this is all about. And it's a function of working through the paradox to these great truths. So the problem that we have is that <laughs> every time we're presented with a choice, we're presented with tension, we're presented with anxiety. To have a choice is to have anxiety and tension because we've got to make this choice and we might make the wrong one, right? Now, we assume in this country, especially and in the West, that more choice equals more freedom, right? To have choices is to have freedom. But have you ever just walked down a grocery aisle and just felt the pressure of all those choices? I mean, which one do I really take? I've got 40 different kinds of fabric softener. Which one is the right one? Oh, no. And which one is the cheapest one? And which one is going to give me? A... We go through all of these gyrations. I remember when I, was, uh, when I was still single ages ago, I could go through the grocery store in under 10 minutes flat. I prided myself on getting through the. I had the exact same things I bought every single time, and I knew exactly where they were, and I could just speed through. I didn't have to think. You might have noticed I've done the same thing with my clothes. I have a uniform that I wear. I don't have to think about it. I just put on. It's black on top. It's blue on the bottom. And it just works fine. I remember meeting this one uh, Methodist pastor who you actually wore the Roman collar, wore the black shirt, you know, with the Roman collar. And he said, it was great. I don't have to think about anything about what I need to wear. It's just right there in the front. And you get free parking at hospitals. He said, it's just great. So here we are. We think choice gives us more freedom. What choice actually gives us is stress. So when we're presented with the paradoxes of life, the, the deeper truths of life, we see them as contradiction, we think that we're going to need to choose because that's our Western men mentality. Only one thing can be true at a time, therefore one is right, one is wrong. We need to choose. We have the stress of the choice, but we make it as quickly as we can so we can relieve the stress. Makes perfect sense, right? But then as soon as we do that, we have driven our car right into the block wall of the contradiction, and we'll never get any further past the paradox into the truth that really is what this is all about. Can we get past the need for security? 
past the need for us to just feel the security of certainty, the illusion of certainty, in order to get to the truth that's behind. That's really the key. As soon as we stop at, at contradiction, there's something that we're for and there's something that we're against. There's something to defend and there's something to attack. There's us and there's them, and everything starts to fall apart in terms of living the kingdom life that Jesus is trying to get us to understand. I've been talking to so many individuals and people in marriages and in families who are finding that their, their houses are divided now. And it's been COVID and politics and everything that's been going on for the past year that has done it. It's been amazing to see. It's been sad to see. I've seen marriages being torn apart because one was either left and the other was right, or one was a massacre and one was not. I was talking to a woman just a couple of days ago, and she said, my family that used to be so close, I feel like we're roommates now. How sad that is. They f she feels like they're roommates now. They just pass each other in the halls. They don't have the connection anymore because of these kinds of divides. And you, you have to think, you know, how do you end up getting to that point? How do you get to the point where your family is now a roommate to you? Where your husband or your wife is now a stranger to you, an adversary to you? Where you just cannot see eye to eye in any way, shape, or form, and the house is suffering because of it? It's by not respecting the paradox. That's how it happens. All of these big truths of lives and these big issues that we are facing are presenting as contradiction, as paradox. And if we're not willing to let go of that need for security, if we're not willing to let go of what we believe is true to the exclusion of all else, as Jesus would say, sell it all, give it away, then we're never going to get to the unity on the other side of it. We'll never be able to realize and experience how relationship can still work in the midst of the paradox in the midst of the disagreement. We'll never see that unity on the other side of that. Life always presents a never-ending series of paradox. We can't get away from it. This is what life is actually made of, made of these poles. Think about it. There's life and there's death. There's heaven and there's earth. There's spiritual and material, religious and secular, male and female. There's intellect and there's emotion. There's work and there's play. There's macro and micro. There's looking at the great causes and careers and things we can do out there. And then there's personal relationships. Obviously, there's left and right. There's conservative and liberal. There's capitalist and socialist. And there's individual rights and there's communal good. All of these are the great poles of the paradoxes that we face in life. And the list goes on and on. We talked last week or the week before about the tyranny of the finite, that we are finite creatures, and that means we can't be everywhere at once, and we don't have enough time to be everywhere eventually, and so we've got to make a choice. But even as we do make a choice, do we have to become defined by the choices we make? And that's really the key. Do we become identified with the choices we make to the extent that the whole consciousness bubble closes in over ourselves and we see ourselves as the choice that we've made so that we can't see anything past that? We have now flopped down on one side or the other of the great paradox and we become that thing. And the walls are so thick that our families are now roommates to us. So we can do both, and this is the thing that we often forget. That anyone with different beliefs, if we have become identified with our own, is a threat to our security. We get a sense of security from our own certainty. Anyone who has a different belief must be converted. And if they won't convert, then we've got to pound them until they do or they have to be ostracized because we can't deal with their presence. It's too threatening to our security. The Jews had the beautiful way of looking at life. The Jews understood us as human beings living in this life between heaven and earth, between the 
unity and the connection of heaven, the oneness of God in heaven, and all of the individual form and function and all the diversity that we experience every day on earth. The idea behind this and the function, the job of the human being, was to bring heaven to earth and earth to heaven. In other words, to merge the two. Realizing that they can't be chosen, one can't be chosen over the other if we're going to live an actual life with God's presence. But to bring the two together, in other words, to see the unity through the diversity. This was their way of understanding that we're not fully human. We're not doing our job until we can begin to merge the two. Now, we fear life because it presents this paradox. It gives us a choice. It gives us the tension and the anxiety. And paradox presents as uncertainty, which drives us absolutely crazy, because uncertainty makes us choose. It makes us anxious. And so we create this illusion of certainty, of knowing the true answer. But here's the irony when we do that. The illusion of certainty that we have chosen the right thing and now we are certain of it takes the aliveness out of life. Once we think we are certain, once we think that we have it all right and everyone else is wrong, the aliveness goes out of life. In John 3, 16, that, that famous verse, Jesus is talking about eternal life. The word for eternal there is alma in Aramaic. It means world at the same time. For God so loved the world, alma, eternal, alma. Alma really means age, era, or generation. Its roots point to never-ending cycles of generation and newness, you know, the, the constant procreation of something new, cycle after cycle, which is why it is used for eternity as well, for the word for eternal. But here's the catch. Jews are always focused on the here and now. For them, eternal life is not life that goes on forever in the next life. For a Jew, eternal life is life that is eternally new and alive and surprising and different right here and right now. Jesus talks about abundant life. It's the same idea. Life that is always invigorating, life that is always presenting something new, never boring, never stagnant, but always presenting as something that's just filling you up with something new. This is the idea of eternal life. That young man who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to obtain eternal life? What did Jesus tell him? you got to sell everything. you got to let go of all your preconceptions that drive you to the certainty that is the illusion of your security if you're ever going to see life presenting as something new and different constantly. The motion of the Spirit through your life always bringing fresh wind from someplace that you know not of, going to where somewhere else that you know not of, to be in that flow of something new, that's eternal life. You can't have it if you're clinging on to what you think you already know with that kind of certainty. So in other words, if we choose sides, if we become certain, life is no longer eternal for us. Why? Because it can no longer surprise us. Think about surprise for a second. Surprise is the greatest gift that life can give us. Surprise. You probably never thought of it that way. Some of you probably don't like surprises. How many of you like surprise parties, all right? But the point is, what if life could never surprise you? What if everything just followed the track that you had already predetermined in your mind? How long would you last being interested in life? How long would life hold any color for you? It is the surprise that changes everything, that fills us again with wonder, with newness, with hope, and with laughter. Do you ever think about why you laugh at things? I want to read you something. This is going to feel like a real digression and diversion, but hopefully you'll enjoy it anyway. What the heck, right? We got time. <laughs> Someone asked second graders, all right? So second graders, how old are second graders? They're about seven, eight? Right in there? Second graders? Okay. So second graders. Ask second graders, why did God make moms? And a series of other questions. you got to listen to what they said. Why did God make mothers? Number one, she's the only one who knows where the scotch tape is. Two, mostly to clean the house. 
Three, to help us out, <laughs> to help us out of there when we were getting born. I love that one. How did God make mothers? God made my mom just the same like he made me. He just used bigger parts. God makes mothers out of clouds and angel hair and everything nice in the world and one dab of mean. Three, they had to get their starts from men, men's bones. Then they mostly used string, I think. Why did God give your mother, why did God give you your mother and not some other mom? Number one, because we're related. <laughs> Two, God knew she likes me a lot more than other people's moms like me. What kind of a little girl was your mom? My mom has always been my mom and none of that other stuff. Number two, I don't know because I wasn't there, but I, my guess is she would be pretty bossy. Number three, <laughs> they say she used to be nice. Why did, what did mom need to know about dad before she married him? His last name. Why did your mom marry your dad? My dad makes the best spaghetti in the world and my mom eats a lot. Number two, she got too old to do anything else with him. And my favorite, my grandma says that mom didn't have her thinking cap on. <laughs> What's the difference between moms and dads? Moms work at, at work. Hey, moms work at work and at home, and dads just go to work at work. Moms know how to talk to teachers without scaring them. Moms have magic. They make you feel better without medicine. Oh, that's very nice. What does your mom do in her spare time? Moms don't do spare time. <laughs> Number two, to hear her tell it, she pays bills all day long. And the last one, what would it take to make your mom perfect? On the outside, she's already perfect. On the inside, she's already perfect. Outside, I think some kind of plastic surgery. And the last one, diet. You know, her hair. I diet, maybe blue. Now. To the extent that these were funny and you were laughing and you at home were laughing, why are they funny? Have you ever thought about why a joke is funny? Any joke, why is it funny? It leads you down, it sets you up down a certain path, a path you think you know, right? The certainty of your logic, the certainty of your experience, and then all of a sudden it hits you with the surprise of the punchline, which takes you somewhere completely different. It's the surprise that makes you laugh. The perspective of little kids, so different than ours as adults, always surprises us when they say the things that they say, and it makes us laugh. It makes us smile. It takes us out of ourselves for just that moment, right? The moment that you're laughing, what else are you thinking about? The moment that you're laughing, what is troubling you at that very instant? The moment that you're laughing is to step out of completely everything that you think you know and enter completely different space. And it's the surprise that does that for you. Think about the vacations that surprised you. They may not have been pleasant at the time because you were fighting it, but it's what you talk about for 20 years afterwards. It's not the ones that went according to plan and itinerary. It's the ones that went off the rails. It's the ones that were so crazy. That's what you talk about and laugh about for decades afterwards. We don't value surprise as much as we should. We don't understand surprise. Because of our fear of the contradictions and the paradoxes of life, because of our fear of the uncertainty of life, we try to lock everything down, button it down, put it under glass. But as soon as we do that, we lose the element of surprise. And as soon as we do that, we lose the aliveness of life. Now I want to turn a corner here and go from the ridiculous to the sublime. One of the greatest paradoxes that we all face is between life and death. How do you deal with life when you know you're going to die? Well, scientists have been looking at that question. Psychologists also have been looking at that question. And they actually devised a test to try to find out exactly what it is the brain is doing in relationship to thoughts about death. So warning, first of all, this story is about death. You might want to click away now. <laughs> That's because researchers say our brains do their best to keep us from dwelling on our inevitable demise. A study found that the brain shields us from existential fear by categorizing death as an unfortunate event that only befalls other people. Isn't that interesting? The brain does not accept that death is related to us, said one of these scientists in Israel. 
We have this primal mechanism that means when the brain gets information that links ourselves to death, something tells us that it's not reliable, so we shouldn't believe it. Being shielded from thoughts of our future death could be crucial for us to live in the present. The protection may switch on early in life as our minds develop and we realize death comes to us all. The moment you have this ability to look into your own future, you realize that at some point you're going to die and there's nothing you can do about it. That goes against the grain of our whole biology, which is helping us to stay alive. To investigate how the brain handles thoughts of death, these colleagues developed a test that involved producing signals of surprise in the brain. They asked volunteers to watch faces flash up on a screen. Okay, so imagine you're sitting and you're watching these faces, faces flash on a screen while their brain activity was monitored. So they got all the wires hanging from them, right? The person's own face and that of a stranger were alternated several times, and then a different face was flashed. On seeing the new face, the brain flickered with surprise because the image clashed with what it had predicted. So they're watching, right, the EKG or whatever it is, and they can see the brain light up when that unexpected face pops on the screen and the surprise is registered. So they know what surprise looks like, in other words, right? Now, various words also appeared above the faces on the screen. Half of the time, these were death-related words, such as funeral or burial. The scientists found that if a person's own face flashed up next to death-related words, their brains shut down its prediction system. It refused to link the self with death, and no surprise signals were recorded. This is our brains. We're not thinking about this. This is just happening to us physiologically. A.V. Goldstein, a senior, a senior author on the paper, said, this suggests that we shield ourselves from existential threats or consciously thinking about the idea that we are going to die by shutting down predictions about the self or categorizing the information as being about other people rather than ourselves. We cannot rationally deny that we will die, but we think of it more as something that happens to other people. In the not-so-distant past, our brain's defenses against thoughts of death were balanced out by the reality of death all around us. Today, he believes, society is more death-phobic, with sick people confined to hospitals and elderly people to care homes. As a result, he suspects, people know far less about the end of life and perhaps have come to fear it more. A psychologist from the University of Kent said, people put up numerous defenses to stave off thoughts of death. The young, in particular, may see it as a problem for other people, he said. His own work had found that in modern societies, people embraced what he called the escape treadmill, where hard work, pub sessions, checking mobile phones, and buying more stuff meant people were simply too busy to worry about death. However, it is not a solution to the problem itself. So we need to keep escaping. We need to keep buying more stuff. We need to keep checking our cell phones. Now, life and death is the primary paradox of human experience. There's no way around it. How do we live with this knowledge of death? How does that, how does that even work? And this is what we do to cope. Our brains physiologically have a coping mechanism, apparently, according to the study at least. But also, we as a society and we as individuals have chosen sides of the paradox to relieve the tension, to relieve the stress, to remove signs of death. He talked about the hospitals and the, the care facilities that take our elderly or take our infirm away from us. We don't see what happens there. It's not like as if they were staying in our house. I know there's hospice care that is coming back you know, into use, but for the most part, we're removed from those end-of-life scenarios. Coroners come and whisk our dead away so we don't see them and we don't see what happens to them after that. Slaughterhouses kill our food for us so we don't have to do that ourselves or see the animals. In fact, we don't want to see any vestige of what that animal looked like under the cellophane in our supermarkets. We just want to see the filet. We just want to see what, you know, if it's got eyes anymore, we don't want to see it. 
at least Asian countries, they'll eat stuff that still looks like what it was, but we get all freaked out, right? Because we don't want to be reminded that something had to die for us to live. And every time we eat something, something had to die in order for us to live. But we want to just pretend that we somehow stand outside the circle of life. We know we don't, but emotionally and psychologically, we're really trying hard to make all of these decisions as a people. Think about funeral homes and what they do to try to mask over what death really means. Think about all the euphemisms we have for death. We don't like to say the word death or die, do we? We say passing on. We say transition. I had one Christian friend who said that his father graduated. They went home. We have all these different ways of talking about death that is not talking about death anymore. Not considering this deeper truth, how death actually gives life to life. It is death that really defines life and life that defines death. We need the two together. If we choose one or the other, everything becomes skewed. We lose the deepness and the deep truth behind. And these paradoxes pile on each other, and, and they, they are logical extensions of each other, if you think about it. If we as a society have basically chosen the material over the spiritual, which we basically have, haven't we? We have minimized religion. We've chosen the secular over the sacred, the material over the spiritual, which means that we also need to choose life over death because how do we deal with death if there isn't some spiritual understanding that life goes on in some way? How does a human being deal with that paradox? Death is the end of our material lives, therefore we can't consider it because we're not no longer really considering the spiritual, the religious, the sacred in society. And because of all this, we now see death as evil, an evil to be avoided at all costs. And we don't see that that really dulls our experience of life. The fear of death causes us to live life defensively. It causes us to reflexively, reflexively just extend life as long as we possibly can without as much consideration for quality of life. No longer are we open to the truth, the unity beyond this paradox of life and death. But it's how we cope. It's how we relieve the stress. Now, how does Jesus address these issues? Not just a paradox, but also in terms of the paradox of life and death. You know, Holy Week is coming. It's coming in two weeks. And each day of Holy Week is going to have a name to it and, and Bible verses attached to it. And on Holy Tuesday, we're going to be hearing the story of the, the ten virgins, the ten bridesmaids, if you will, 12 or 13-year-old girls who are friends of the bride. And there's five foolish and there's five wise. Remember that story? Let's, let's read it just so we, we have it fresh in mind. Matthew 25, starting at verse 1. Now notice that Jesus is comparing this story to the kingdom of heaven. He's trying to illustrate what the kingdom of heaven is all about. He says, the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in their flasks along with their lamps. Now when the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep, but at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and for you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the hour nor the day. Now, normally we take this story and we interpret it in terms of eschatological or end times, right? We think of it as last judgment type of scenario that Jesus is looking forward to that. 
But remember that Jesus is comparing this story to kingdom. Kingdom is not about the next life. Kingdom is about the quality of life that we can have right here and right now. When we are negotiating paradox, when we are allowing paradox to do its work and allow us to see the unity with the Father's eyes beyond the apparent contradictions of life. So this story is not about something in the future. This story is about something right here and right now. It's about an immediate state of being, just as it is with eternal life. Not something out there, but something right here, the eternal aliveness of life. Same thing is going on here. The context brings it home to right here and right now. And all of this context is in the context of the Hebrew wedding tradition. And I know that I've probably done this to death in your minds, but it's so important for us to keep coming back to it because no matter how much we think we've got it intellectually, it just takes time for us to steep in these new concepts before they really become part of our muscle memory, before they really become something that we're not skittering back and forth between. The Hebrew wedding tradition was the anchor of ancient life in many ways. It's what anchored communities together. The practice of the boys always staying home with the father's house. The girls always going to the home of the groom, which was the home of the father. You never had son-in-laws living with you, only daughter-in-laws. That's why it's so interesting when Jesus talks about the main family units. He talks about son and daughter and daughter-in-law, but never son-in-law because you didn't have that experience in your home. It was only the girls that changed forms. And it's also interesting that it was only the boys that really needed the, the formal rites of passage because the girls were getting them. They had to go to a completely different home, sometimes in a completely different place. If it was far enough away and all these marriages were arranged, they didn't have any say in it. They may not ever see their family of origin again. Rites of passage were built in, not to mention childbirth, built into a girl's life, but not into a boy's. They needed the separate rituals. But the wedding tradition was such that it was separated between the betrothal, the kedushin, and the wedding, the nisuin, by a period of maybe one to two years. And the bride needed to live in that space, never knowing when the groom was going to come, because the groom didn't know when he was going to come to get his bride. It was the father who allowed the groom permission to go and claim his bride when the addition to the house at their apartment where they were going to live, the mansion, was completed. So nobody knew. And if you are double thinking this with me, how many times did Jesus say, you don't know the day and the hour. He says it right here. He says, I don't even know. Only the Father in heaven knows. And we get all theologically weird about that. But basically, he's alluding back to the wedding feast and the tradition that they all understood, all his listeners understood. But the point of this is that this bride is living in a paradox. She's living the life that she always knew. And remember, she's only 12 to 14 years old, maybe. But at any moment, the groom can come back and snatch her up and take her, raise her up in a, in a raised cart and take her back to the Father's house. At any moment, her life can change absolutely and forever. And she's excited about this. She's anticipating having her own home, her own family, her own children, but at the same time, at the cost of what she has right now. To live in the presence of sucking the marrow out of every moment with the only family that you've ever known while still sweetly anticipating the change that is coming at any moment is that state of being that Jesus calls kingdom. It's what the Jews said, that the, the nation of Israel was the bride of Yahweh, understanding that our life here on earth, between birth and death, between life and death, between the betrothal and the wedding, is that period we were living as a bride lives for that period. And the church picked up on that and said, the church is the bride of Christ, understanding that in this period we are living in exactly the same way. How can we, without resolving one side or the other, live with that paradox in such a way that it invigorates and enlivens every moment of our lives? Why were the five virgins foolish. Why were the five bridesmaids foolish? Because they were so focused just on the here and now that they lost the anticipation of the groom's arrival. 
They didn't prepare for the groom's arrival. They weren't aware of or conscious of the change that was going to occur at any moment. And so they weren't ready for it. They were flopped down on one side of the equation. But what happens if we flop down on the other side? See, we can favor life so much that we forget about what is happening later, that death is coming to us all, that there is going to be a change that will be a surprise for us. But we can also flop down to the other side and be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Have you heard that one before? To focus so much on heaven that this life just becomes kind of a necessary evil that we have to get through without breaking the contract, without messing up so badly that we don't get to go to heaven in the next life. But if all the focus is there, then what is it about this life that we are living? There's no balance. Equally, when we fall down to one side or another, how do we deal with this paradox? Jesus is showing us. We balance the way the bride balances. We balance the way the wise bridesmaids have balanced. Still living their lives, sleeping, but with that eye, with that second awareness on what is to come. And staying in that balance makes all the difference to become life-obsessed, to avoid death, to become death-obsessed, to avoid life. This is missing the mark of exactly what Jesus is trying to get us. We can strike the balance between the two by not becoming defined by either side. We have to live both sides. To not is to make a choice. But to live both sides without becoming defined by each I am not just a citizen of this world. I am not just a physical being, but I'm also not just a spiritual being either. And we hear people in the church flopping down on, on that side and people in society flopping down on the other. Can we hold both together? And not just to say that my, my soul, my everlasting soul, is now incarcerated in a corruptible body. I mean, that is to demean life, not celebrate it. Can we celebrate both at the same time? Can we hold both in an embrace that is firm enough to keep us grounded, but not so tight that we squeeze the life out of one or the other? This is what Jesus is talking about here. That anticipation of what is coming reveals the eternal quality of life, always new, always changing. It reveals the deeper truth that doesn't resolve the paradox for us, but makes the eternal alive for us amid the uncertainty, amid the unknowing that is the human condition and cannot be changed. We will never be certain in this life. We can be convinced, but we can't be certain. Can we learn to live well with the uncertainty, with the unknowing? Will we live allowing life to continue to surprise us with something new? The only way we do it is by letting go of the certainty that we're clinging to, to let go, selling everything of the knowing that we think we have that blocks us from just allowing life to surprise us to allowing life to be what it is. The willingness to live in unknowing in the presence of the paradox between heaven and earth. Why has this pandemic divided us so greatly? And I've said in here that for almost 14 years now, nothing has really divided our community. Not theology, not politics, but masks have divided us. And I just find that amazing that something like masks have divided us in this pandemic. Now, I think we're going to be able to bridge that gap and come back together again because I believe in us. But it's been amazing to see how that has happened. Why has it happened? Why has the pandemic this power to divide us? Why has it created roommates where there used to be family? The pandemic has stripped away our ability to avoid death, hasn't it? It's created an existential fear in us that something out there that is invisible that we can't see and can't even see how it's being transmitted could get us and kill us. 
We are seeing people die, loved ones, family members. We're seeing them die. We're watching the numbers on the board raise. We are living with death in our faces for a year and counting now. That ability that we had as a society to shove that down, to shelve it away, to keep it under cellophane in the grocery stores has been sort of obliterated for us. And the fear has crept back up again. The fear, the tension. It's forced us to renegotiate the paradox is what it's actually doing. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing at all. We have lived as a society for so long on one side of the ledger to be forced to consider the other side is a good thing. But when we won't do it, then what are we going to do? We're going to double down even harder on whatever side that we have fallen on, whatever side that we say we believe. We're just going to build our walls that much thicker until nothing can get through and family becomes roommates. And our relationships become the casualty of this whole process. Good Friday and Easter are the primary paradox of Christianity. It is the evergreen paradox that never goes away, that is always trying to teach us something deeper and deeper and deeper, century after century, millennia after millennia, and person after person, generation after generation. It is always fresh. It is always right there in our faces. If we don't try to resolve it, it will continue to do its work. Now, we fight over theological issues, don't we? We, we turn the paradox of Easter and, and Good Friday into just a theological debate. Was it a bodily resurrection? When did it happen? How did it happen? And we fight all those. But you know what? That's not what it's about. Good Friday is the death of Jesus. Easter is the resurrection of Jesus. This is about the primary paradox of life between Life and death, heaven and earth. It's all bringing it back to us in a microcosm. How do we deal with this main paradox of our lives in a way that takes us into kingdom? This Lent, if we can not become defined by the theological choices that we make, and we all have them, and that's fine, we need our choices and we need our convictions. But to not become defined or identified with them so deeply that we can't see anything past them, that we can still retain the mystery of life, even as we passionately work our choices. Can we push into how death is the surprise that makes life alive, that makes life eternal, eternally alive? And can we push into how resurrection is a surprise that takes the sting out of death, takes the fear out of death? And how the surprise of paradox can transform our lives into kingdom? Those are the deep, deep questions that we should be asking ourselves this Lent. But it starts with the willingness to let go. It starts with the willingness to sell everything that we think is so certain that it can block us from moving into these deeper places. If we can't be surprised, then we're not living as Jesus lived. Think of his astonishment at the centurion that we just talked about. His ability to be surprised was the greatest gift. He's trying to give it to us. Are we going to pick it up? Let's pray. Father, you are the surprise. You are unknowable intellectually, but completely knowable in terms of our presence, in terms of our emotion, in terms of our conviction. And that's another paradox we have to deal with. Help us more and more, Father, to let go of our minds, to let go of trying to create that certainty just in the name of security. Allow us to move into a place that initially feels a little more risky, just so that we can move into a place that can actually surprise us again. Thank you for everything that you give us, for the continual paradoxes, 
that you have engineered into life that are always drawing us deeper. And thank you for the church that has come up with these theological paradoxes that we can use to drive ourselves even deeper into your presence. Help us to do exactly that. Help us to use what's left of Lent to be able to find ourselves much closer to you at the celebration of your resurrection. Never let us forget, Lord, we can only do any of this because you did it first. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen? Let's all stand.